Great. All right. So my talk is called GMO, the status quo. Uh, and it, it all kind of centers around um, one very basic question. What happened to food? And I know that's almost so basic that it's kind of a dumb question, but like we all know something has happened to our food system and it's really hard to pin down exactly what that was. Um, what I'm getting at is that globally, we have it excellent right now. Our food system is awesome. Uh, this is a Swedish statistician, Hans Rosling. He's one of my heroes and he's well famous for these bubble charts that he makes that shows human progress with other, other metrics, right? So, in this bubble chart, we're looking at kilocalories per person per day and life expectancy, and the big bubbles are China and India. And as you can see, as we've moved through time, things have improved, right? Access to food has improved. But if you look at our food headlines, that does not play out in the way that we talk about food and what we hear about food. So our food is better than it's ever been, but we hear that it's worse than it's ever been, and that does not make any sense to me whatsoever. None at all. Uh, so, uh, we have a saying in Canada that Canadians are born everywhere in the world and sometimes it just takes them a while to get here. I'm a, I'm a fourth generation Canadian. I, um, I'm Ukrainian and Polish, that's my heritage, and I'm second generation off the farm. Um, I've grown up in agriculture though. I have kind of one foot in ag, one foot in the city, and, uh, and I've enjoyed traveling the world and talking to scientists uh, in various countries about the intricacies of farming and what goes into it and what goes into making the tools that farmers need to do their job effectively. And I have a lot of fun in my job, as you can see. Um, I grew up with a camera in my hand. That's the other facet of my personality. I love cameras. I love looking at the world through different points of view and putting cameras in neat places. This was my first viral video success, uh, where I strapped a GoPro camera to a hula hoop. And uh, <laughs> as you can see, this shot taught me a really valuable lesson about frame of reference, right? The idea that kind of where you sit amongst all the orbiting data and opinions and bodies, it, it's going to define how you see a situation. Where you sit defines what you see more than anything else. This is what a hula hoop looks like from a hula hoop's perspective. And I think, I think when we talk about food, that food is often uh, subject to those same referential blind spots, to narrow perspectives. I think that empathy is one of the key tools we have to open up those frames of reference and to see food from each other's point of views. But this is a challenge because in the food system, we've got seed and chem companies who see food one way, and we've got farmers who see, who see food from yet another perspective, and then consumers who see it in their own way. And we are all looking at the same thing from different angles and seeing it a little bit differently. And this can cause a lot of problems if it's not addressed before we try to have discussions about food. And so I wondered what goes into this, what causes these differences in frames of reference. And number one is that perception requires involvement. You cannot perceive something if you don't have some form of involvement in it. And this is unfortunate because when we talk about food, in North America, about 1-2% to of our population is involved in the agricultural system. You could argue that 0.2% of that actually produces 80% of the food. In Europe, it's about 2-4% to depending on how you define a farm. But that means that at most, 96% of consumers don't have a clue. They're not involved in food production. How can they perceive what they're not involved in? The second issue that I see all the time is that abundance creates a lack of perspective, right? We are drowning in food. In North America, we certainly are. In Europe, to the same extent, I think. Like, we cannot see the forest for the trees, or the trees for the forest, however you want to look at it. And when it comes to perspective, I think the average consumer who's maybe a little unsure about biotechnology, you know, looks at food and says, well, we have organic versions of everything we have GMO versions of. Why do we need biotechnology in food anyways? And the third, and possibly the most devastating to all of this, is that food is a status symbol. And I know it always has been, but in modern times, we tie it really strangely to ideas of celebrity and to cost. And we've set up a system in food where healthy food is clean and wholesome and expensive. And it is, it's part of this elitism structure where you have to have the money to pay for good food. Whereas bad food is dirty and cheap, right? Good food's clean. Gwyneth Paltrow loves it, 
right? Um, this plays out, perfect example of this is Vivian Westwood. She's a fashionista. I'm sure people here know who she is. And she was quoted once when asked what people should do when they can't afford to eat organic, they should eat less. That was her answer. So this is food elitism at its peak. And it's disgusting, right? It's absolutely gross. So in review, uh, we've got, oh, oh, skip the slide. It's not working. Video. There it goes. So again, perception requires involvement, which we simply don't have. Abundance creates a lack of perspective that's so deep that we can't even really tell we have a lack of perspective. It's stunning Kruger. And food is a status symbol. And these are the things that are going into our frames of reference. And these are the things that are informing who's coming from food from what angle. And this is what it starts to look like. It gets to be a cloudy disaster. And trying to uncloud this so that we can actually have a discussion about food, that's where most of us get hung up. Like, we can't even talk about it in North America or Europe. We can't, we can't have a discussion because of our differing frames of reference. So I want to move our frame of reference to Africa. I've spent a little bit of time there. And I think, that, I think it's valuable to just remove ourselves from our common day to day and see things from a different vantage point. Um, and, and Africa, and, and in particular Kenya and Uganda, have a lot of things going on that make it a really interesting place to see food from. But before we go, I need to stop for a second and just recognize, as I'm sure you can all see, I'm, I'm not Ugandan or Kenyan, right? I'm U Canadian, Ukrainian. And I think that that's really important. Um, I don't want to be appropriative in talking about Africa, right? And I, I'm trying to show you what food looks like from an African frame of reference, recognizing that I am still looking through that frame from my privileged frame, right? So, uh, you know, perception requires involvement. I was in Africa for two and a half weeks. Limited, right? Um, abundance creates lack of perspective. I am affluent. And uh, food is status. You know, I can afford to buy the weird labels. So. That's a thing that needs to be recognized here. Another aspect of this is that I, um, I grew up in a Christian household, so evangelical church in Canada, and missionary work was a huge part of what our church did. And the, uh, the kind of adage that went along with that was, you can give a man a fish, or you can teach a man to fish. We all heard that saying before, right? You can give a man a fish or teach a man to fish. There is, however, a secret third option that they don't tell you in church, and that is don't assume they've never heard of catching or eating fish. Right? It's a very simple thing to do from a North American standpoint to just forget that maybe Africa has its own thoughts about how it wants to use biotechnology. If you change the fish out in this metaphor, it's like we can either give Africa the, the genetic, genetically modified food we grow, or we can show them how we do it and you know, they'll, they'll do what we do. That's not really how it plays out though. Um, before I go much further, I just want to give a little bit of floor space to an actual Ugandan person. So this is Patricia Nantiza, and she's a Cornell Alliance for Science fellow. She's a well-known journalist in Uganda, and she also helps biotech companies with their communication strategies a bit. So I found this video of Patricia, um, and I think it's really important to just start with this before we go any further. The scaremongering that, that is seeping into our countries is, is basically fueled from, from USA or from Europe, and I, I, I sort of understand like where they are coming from. They are speaking from their own point of view. I hear in France they have very little pretty gardens and then they can walk around and pick out weeds. You wake up on, on a bright Saturday morning and then you put on your pretty purple gloves and then you go and you're picking all this manure and taking pictures and posting on Facebook. They are saying everyone should have a little pretty garden where they're not using any modern seeds, they should farm the way their grandparents farmed. And they're saying that because for them, gardening is a hobby. That is not farming in Africa or in Uganda. We farm to get food. We farm to get an income. And this is our livelihood. It's not like some sort of hobby. My message to people in the US and Europe is please realize the extent of your decisions. It doesn't stop with you. It goes all the way to all continents of the world. There you go. So let Africa speak for herself. 
I recognize that I'm a white guy <laughs> telling you what Africa is saying, so bear with me on that. I did run this all past Patricia to make sure that I was uh, not being appropriative, so I, I think I got the tone of this right. Um, so anyways, uh, I spent two and a half weeks in East Africa, in Kenya and Uganda. Uh, again, not a lot of time, but it was enough that it drastically changed my frame of reference. It drastically expanded it. And um, I, I'm not claiming that anything in this talk is anything besides anecdotal, right? This is my own experience, it's editorial, but it humbled me and it, it checked me in a lot of good ways. So I am just earnestly going to share with you what I saw there. Again, my own interpretation, okay? So take it for what it is. So day one, part one, I find myself on a matoke farm. Uh, matoke is a cooking banana, that's, that's what it is. Um, and it's, I mean, it's not a Cavendish, it's not sweet like that, it's a little, little starchier. 33% of global banana production comes from this sub-Saharan African region though, and 70 million people get 25% of their daily calories from matoke. It is not a small crop, it's a big deal for a lot of people. Um, this is awesome on the farmer, and this is Osman's son, and this is Osman's farm that I got the privilege to look around on. And this is pretty representative of what you're going to see all across Uganda, because as opposed to North America or Europe, 70% of Ugandans are involved in agriculture directly. What does that do to the conversation? Everybody is on the exact same page. Just like Patricia said, there are no illusions that backyard gardens are going to feed the Ugandan population, which again, from a North American perspective, so, so refreshing to get there and have real frank discussions with people who have skin in the game. The trouble with 70% of your population being involved in agriculture is that if something happens, it affects 70% of your people's livelihood, right? And unfortunately, with regards to Matoke, bacterial wilt was wreaking havoc on Matoke farms when I was there in this kind of region of Uganda. So this is a healthy Matoke bunch. That's what it should look like. And if you were to cut a healthy Matoke tree down, this is what it should look like. But this is what's happening on Osamon's farm. Pus, right? Gross. And those are rotten Matoke on the branch. This is what bacterial wilt does. So I got a chance to talk to Osman about the struggles on his farm. I'm like, what can you do about this? It's a bacterial vector, um, soil borne. There's some argument that it's even airborne, um, but it gets passed around by dirty shovels. It gets passed around by workers moving field to field. It gets passed around from infected Matoke being passed around. Um, and, and better information has helped control the disease to some extent, but there is no chemical control for this that's available to Ugandans. So really Osman's only solution here uh, is to cut down his grove of bananas and hope that his neighbors don't get the disease from him. So this is what he's dealing with on his farm. It's just stumps where there used to be a banana tree. Uh, when I was there, it was 2015. I was in my mid-20s. Uh, I have a three-year-old now. He just started school today, and I, I, I get choked up whenever I think about Osman and his son, because when I look at Osman's face, I see the face of a dad who doesn't know how he's going to feed his kid. And that's tragic, that's a place that we are so freaking lucky we don't find ourselves in here. And it's important we recognize that. So moving on, part two of my same first day in Uganda. Now I'm on a cassava farm in a different county. So cassava, again, something we may not be familiar with. If you have eaten tapioca, you've eaten cassava. Um, but cassava is to the Ugandans what the potato is to the Irish. Like it's, it's the staple cultural starch, right? Um, and we're talking fairly large numbers here too. We're talking per capita 132 kilograms per year, which is fairly significant. 11% of daily caloric intake in Uganda. And in the area I was in, in Mpiji County, it could even go a lot higher than that, uh, depending on the farmer and the area. Farmer, this is the farmer Susan. These are Susan's dependents. So some of these are Susan's kids, some are her relatives' kids. But needless to say, these are the kids who get their daily calorie intake from Susan's farm, right? And unfortunately, cassava mosaic disease is wreaking havoc on Susan's farm. This is kind of a heat map, an incidence rate map. Uh, you know, green is zero and yellow, orange is like 31 to 50%. In that highlighted county where I was in, it's, it's pretty well full up. And, and Susan's farm, I think, was in the probably 30 to 50% infection rate at this point. So what this looks like is it looks like chlorosis in the leaves in a mosaic kind of pattern. Um, you sometimes see symptomology on the stems, but not always, and that'll be really important in a second, but the roots. That's a healthy cassava and a not healthy in my partner's hand there. You get these stunted cassava where you should have a big hardy crop and they're 
they're scarred on the outside and you open them up and they're filled with necrotic spots. They're inedible, right? So it ruins and you, you just, you just lose your, you lose your cassava. Um, and so same thing, right? The thing with the stems is that that's how cassava is planted. It's planted from stem cuttings. So if your stems aren't showing the disease, those cuttings can get passed around and that can spread the disease even further. Very similar to bacterial wilt. There's not a chemical control option that is readily available. I don't want to give the impression that this has devastated Uganda though, because actually a good information has helped control cassava mosaic disease. So on average, the incidents are going down, but these kids don't get fed by what is happening on an average, right? On Susan's farm in particular, they're screwed. They're screwed. And I'm here from North America looking at this farm and I'm thinking to myself as I'm there, oh, this is a weird one from a North American or a Eurocentric point of view because what, like, what crop disease do we deal with where there's not some control option? Like in Canada, for example, you know, where we grow canola and all these kinds of, like we have sclerotinia happening in canola. It's pretty bad, but we have control options. We have information at our fingertips. We have experts. We have everything we need, better genetics, whatever, right? We have the tools we need. We can even ask for new tools to be invented if we need to control something. That's not the case in Uganda though. So this question, what happened to food? I think from Asamon and Susan's perspective, it's a pretty stark and clear answer. What happened was a disease came. We didn't have the tools we needed. So the disease came through and ravaged our farm. And now our, uh, our kids are in question about where they're going to get their calories from, right? It's, it's really that simple from this point of view. Okay, so moving right along now, I'm in Uganda, day three, I find myself at a lab. Uh, this is a Naro lab, uh, which is a, a Ugandan-ran institution, right? So the first thing there is, this is pretty impressive, like, give a man a fish, teach a man to fish. I didn't realize they knew how to fish this well <laughs> in Uganda, like, they're doing some pretty sophisticated stuff. African scientists figuring out solutions to African problems. This is Dr. Jerome Kugaribe, and what he showed me in this field absolutely floored me. This is two hours from Osamon's farm over one razor wire fence, and we're looking at a field of immune banana plants. They are immune to bacterial wilt, right? Resistant to the point of being immune. And these are here, right here, where that is happening two hours away. Um, and that's really interesting because if we think now about this question, what happened to food, if we have this banana in place and we rewind and we ask, you know, this question to Asamon and Susan again, what happened to food? A disease came, we had the solution we needed, crops are fine, sun is well fed, right? It changes the whole paradigm really quickly if these solutions are there. Now you can see my face as I'm flying to Kenya and this is starting to weigh on me, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm a little dazed at this point. And uh, I find myself on a test plot uh, in Kenya. Uh, day eight, again, African solutions at an African lab from African scientists for African problems. And here I am on a plot of transgenic virus resistant cassava. So again, this is the solution to Susan's problem. And it's sitting right here in a field. And I have free access to it, but for whatever political reasons, Susan can't get what she needs. And it was at this point I got really frustrated. It was just like five days ago. It was the first time I ever saw cassava. And it's the first time I really understood the gravity of the cassava problem uh, with diseases. And six days later, I'm standing uh, in a field of what could be the solution to the problem. Uh, if only people would let it do what it needed to do. And it's pretty fascinating, actually, when it all comes down to it. Is it's, uh, it's growing right now. You know, this... This is a real solution that uh, exists, and it exists in the face of the farmers who need it, and all we're doing is holding up a solution that's already there. So, I don't know what to tell these farmers, and I don't know what to tell you as my audience. All I know I can do is show you, and that's what I'm trying to do is show you. And I have been in that frame of mind since that trip. Just trying to figure this all out, right? What happened to food? And I think Patricia largely nailed it in, in her little video there, right? What happened was we started influencing Africa, right? I mean, honestly, like I'm, I'm there with good intentions, but it's arguably no different, right? I'm still inserting myself into their culture and, and, and trying to help them in my own way. So in 2015, when I was there, like Uganda was this close to passing biosafety bills. Like they were this close. I was trying to tell an optimistic story, but we're in 2019 and parliament and the president are still kicking these bills around, 
right? Nothing, nothing has been put in place yet legally to allow Susan or Osman to access these crops because Europeans and North Americans come in there and we tell them that GMO means greed, money, and oppression. <laughs> And, uh, and we, we stall them out. And we have, a, we have some common arguments that get used in Africa on a regular basis. So I'm just going to go through these really quick. GMO means chemical use, glyphosate, right? Africa doesn't need that. And you can't really blame the public for seeing it this way. I mean, especially in Canada, most of the crops that we see that are genetically modified are herbicide tolerant, right? That is what the public understands genetic modification to be. It is linked intrinsically to chemical application. So this is what we say. They don't want chemicals in Africa. They don't need that, right? Oh, and also it means that Monsanto is going to colonize Africa, right, with their products. So my question to you would be, why has that not happened yet? Like, why has how why has Monsanto not made a cassava mosaic disease resistant cassava? There is no market in it. <laughs> We're talking 70 million people who eat that as a staple crop. That's peas. That's nothing. It's nothing. Why would you put money into that IP when you could make corn or soy or canola, right? Just make a killing, obviously. Uh, it also means, you know, GMO means the EU won't take Africa exports. And this one particularly pisses me off because this is Damocles, right? This is well-fed people hanging a trade dagger over hungry people and saying, oh, you know, don't eat or we might not take your food. That's, that's a dick move. So 2015, Nick, <laughs> if you would ask me at that point, like, what is the reason for all of this? I probably would have just squarely pointed the finger at anti-GMO protesters and said, there's your problem, right? 2019, Nick, he's lived with this a little longer, he's a little more tired, and uh, <laughs> the answer is unfortunately a little more complicated than that, but summarizing it, um, what happened to food? Uh, well, my simplest way I can boil this down is that empathy became less profitable than apathy, and I'll explain that right now. So, in the early 90s, the organic industry made a choice to go non-GMO, right? Reasons aside, that set up an interesting paradigm where all of a sudden now you were charging a premium for food that is very similar, but you have to convince consumers to pay that extra amount. So you get weird marketing like this. Organic farmers spray their crops with water, right? <laughs> and no chemicals. That's the implication, right? Conventional farmers use dirty chemicals, organic farmers are clean, and thus you should pay more for it. And this is really interesting because it had a very profound effect. It bifurcated the food system, right? Now we have two kinds of food. Like, that's what we're living with now. We've got clean, wholesome, expensive celebrity food, and we've got dirty, cheap, normie people food, right? <laughs> that's, that's what the system is like now. And unfortunately, this goes from the top to the bottom of the supply chain. It is a little bit of a golden age for genetic testing and verification. It's a really good time to be a lab that proves things are GMO or not. It's a great time to be a seed shipper and charge a premium for segregating GMO and non-GMO products, right? Charge a premium, it's awesome. And if you are a seed or chemical company, hell, you're not immune to it either, right? Your customers are farmers, not consumers. If consumers hate GMOs, that's fine. You're still selling them. Why not also sell non-GMO project verified seed and play both sides of that fence? And that's what companies like Cargill do now. They have GMO and non-GMO project verified seed. And that's really interesting, right? Because monopolies are awesome for bottom lines. <laughs> and what we have now is we have a food market where because of protests, directly because of this, this causes the regulatory system to get out of control. And now we've got, it takes 10 years and $100 million in cases to deregulate a GMO crop because of the protests. Now that's really interesting because that keeps these players out of the market. It keeps academia out. It keeps the market clean for the big players. So do the big players actually have a vested interest in anti-GMO protests? I would say yes. I would say these people have a cleaner market and a, a better share of the market because of the anti-GMO protests. And we favor crops like GMO corn and canola and soy while orphan crops like golden rice and cassava and banana sit on the shelves because nobody can afford to deregulate them because empathy became less profitable than apathy. And our common interests shifted. Back in the day, back in Thresher and steam engine days, all of our interests were the same. It didn't matter if you were making the seed, growing the seed, or eating the seed. Everybody just needed more seed, <laughs> right? And at some point, when we, when we got to this level of abundance, that started to shift, right? And now we're in a place where, unfortunately, the, the number one thing that chemical and seed companies are trying to do is increase demand for seed and chemicals. This could conflict with best practices or with managing resistance. Farmers in North America 
are being forced to adopt organic growing systems because they're gonna lose their farm if they don't get the premium market. So I know guys who hate the ethics of it. They hate keeping consumers ignorant, but they cannot keep farming if they don't have some organic premium going. And the unfortunate thing is that conflicts with telling consumers the truth about food, and that's bad for consumers. And all consumers want is safe and clean food, and they have had it for freaking years, but they have been so extensively gaslit by our own industry into believing that their food is dangerous. How do we, how do we fix that, right? This is it, this is the GMO status quo. It exists because of apathy, make no mistake about it, that's what it is, and it hurts farmers, I think, more than anybody else in the supply chain, because they're between two groups who are, <laughs> are just squeezing them tight, right? And, and what this looks like in, again, North America, it means adopting systems that you might have ethical questions about, but you don't feel good about participating in, but you need to do it, and that sucks. Uh, in Europe, it could mean losing a one in a hundred year herbicide because the public thinks this is what farmers are doing with it. That's pouring it on Cheerios, right? And in Africa, I mean, you can't access the tools we can access in North America because rich, well-fed white people are telling your government, no. And that's it. That's the GMO status quo. I'm sorry, that doesn't leave you with much solution. And I've spent years thinking, like, what the hell do we do about it now? I think yesterday some of this was addressed, right? What we do about it is we, we figure out better ways of making crops than using transgenics. And I think that's largely what's happened. I think that the, the bad will towards... GMO has spurred on innovation in other sectors. So that's, that's a good start. But I think this all rests with farmers. I truly believe that farmers are the key to cleaning up this status quo because farmers need public trust and social license in order to do their job effectively. In Canada, there's a, there's a center called the Canadian Center for Food Integrity that does public trust research. So who does the public associate with their biggest concerns? GMOs, hormones, antibiotics, and pesticides. Look where scientists are. And look where farmers are. <laughs> That's profound, right? Farmers, they're the ones that they associate their concerns with. At the same time, who is doing the best job of providing information to consumers? They also say farmers are. Now that to me is a very interesting thing. Farmers are simultaneously on the hook for all of the issues, but there's also what the public trusts for information about food. To me, that means the following. It means that farmers they can either be a major liability to the conversation about food or a major asset to the conversation about food. And I believe, and my job at No Ideas Media is to empower farmers to expertly communicate with the public. And I believe that ensures that they are an asset rather than a liability to the conversation. Wrapping this all up, uh, you know, we talk a lot about the next 30 years of food production and based on what we've seen, this is what I truly believe. I think if we fail to feed ourselves over the next 30 years, we cannot blame anybody but ourselves. It's just, it's our own fault. We have the tools we need. We are tripping over our own feet, trying to figure out how to implement these things. And we're missing empathy. I think empathy is critical. I really want the food system to work in a way where chemical companies can see what consumers and farmers are thinking, and farmers can see the frames of reference of other people too. I want to just build these bridges because I don't want the status quo to stay the way that it is. Who, what was the quote yesterday at the end of the talk yesterday where he said, of people who want things to stay the way they are? It was beautiful, and I think that that so keenly comes up here. So that's all I've got. I really want you guys to take a picture of this slide here and follow me on YouTube or Facebook or Twitter or wherever you get your social media kicks um, because that's where we're doing the work. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. Sorry I ran over because of my stupid videos, but yeah.